All right, here we are again in Unit 1, Exploring One Variable Data. This video is for Topic 1.5, Representing a Quantitative Variable with Graphs. So there are many ways to display a quantitative variable with a graph. Remember, for categorical, you pretty much just got bar charts and pie charts. But for quantitative data, you've got a couple different more. So deciding which to use can be very important. So one way to help us to identify which type of quantitative variable you are working with. So there are two different types of quantitative variables. And if you go back to the video over quantitative variables, I did discuss that there are two different ways of looking at quantitative variables, measuring and counting. So that means there are two different types of quantitative variables in a way. They are called discrete quantitative variables or continuous quantitative variables. So the first is a discrete quantitative variable. A discrete variable can take on a countable number of values. The number of values may be finite or countably infinite, as with counting numbers. Think about a list of possible values in countable, right? So a list of possible values is countable. So the key thing here is if you're talking about a variable that's in the form of a number, and that number was counted, that makes a discrete quantitative variable. So if you're counting how many, team, how many wins a soccer team gets, oh, that team got five wins, that team got seven wins, that team got ten wins, you're simply counting up how many wins they have. That's discrete. You're counting the number of skittles in a bag. One, two, three, four. That's a discrete quantitative variable. Or if you're saying, okay, um, how many times does a geyser erupt in a day? So you're going to look at a geyser at location A and it erupts five times. You counted five times it erupts a day. So for discrete, we're, we're, we're thinking whole numbers for the most part, like the countable numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, so forth. Um, not really working with negatives or anything like that here. So we're working with countable values, not measured here, again, counted. So we say that it's finite, meaning that there's like only a set number. Like how many Skittles could be a bag, could be in a bag? I mean, you could go zero. I mean, it's not infinite. You can't have a million Skittles in a bag. I mean, maybe somewhere out there, there's a million Skittles in a bag, but again, not possible, not really gonna happen. So it could be infinite. But usually, if it is, it's countably infinite. Like, you could go to the Skittles factory, and maybe there would be a million Skittles there. But the whole point is you're counting. That's discrete. Whereas a continuous quantitative variable is that it can take on infinitely many values, right? But those values cannot be counted. They're measured. So no matter how small the interval between two values of a continuous variable it is always possible to determine another value between them. So think here, the list is infinite, like, right? So I gave an example here of height of a student, right? So if you think of the height of a student and you come up with, let's say, an interval, right? Like you say, you know, the height of a student can be anywhere from 66 to 65. Well, or I said that, I guess, in the wrong order, 65 to 66, right? Those are two values, and this creates an interval, anywhere from 65 to 66. Well, technically, the height of a student could be anywhere in between there, and it's actually infinite, right? Like 65.1 inches tall, 65.2 inches tall, 65.3 inches tall. You could get really finite and say, hey, somebody could be 65.246 inches tall. So again, we're not counting anything here. This is measurable. And it's in a way that makes it really infinite, right? Um, another example is the concentration of uh, salt in a water sample. Again, if you think about how many milligrams of salt there could be per liter of water, you could say, well, I guess there could be anywhere from, you know, one to, let's say, 15 milligrams per liter of water. But again, how many different options are in between there? It's literally infinite. We're not just thinking whole numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're thinking decimals, three decimals, four decimals, five decimals. It really could be anything. So if you're thinking about the data being whole numbers that was counted, discrete. If you're thinking about numbers that were measured that can take on literally any value possible, now you're thinking continuous. So those are the two different types of quantitative variables that we have. Now let's focus on how to make graphs of them. So all of these graphs usually, or not all, all usually, they're always going to start with a number line. That number line needs to go in order, and that number line needs to represent the possible values that the variable can take on. The number line can begin and end wherever you want it to, as long as it covers all of your data. So you don't have to start at zero if there's no data. Like if there's no data until, say, 150, well, then start it at 150. 
You can choose the interval to which your um, number line goes by. Do you want it to go by fives, tens, twos, threes, twenties, fifty? That's completely up to you, but it does need to remain the same. All right, these graphs all represent the distribution of the data that's collected. That is what values the variable took on and how often it took on those variant values. So at the end of this um, topic, we're going to talk about what we see in these graphs. And what we see is called the distribution. Again, the distribution is just seeing where your data falls, right? What's the lowest? What's the highest? Is there more data here? Is there less data here? That's the kind of things we look for when we talk about a distribution. All right, so the first type of graph we have is called a dot plot. This is best for discrete variables, right? Whole numbers, really nice. So imagine if we had 14 kids and we asked them how many hours a week do you exercise and how many hours a week do you play video games? So we have two different dot plots here, one for each variable. So again, this is quantitative because the answer they're giving us is a number. And um, this technically could be continuous it's discrete in the sense that the kids were giving me a single value because you know, it's kind of art. You know, if you ask a kid I mean, how many hours, no kids going to be like, oh, I spent 6.25 hours playing video games. They could. So this is one of those variables that could become discrete or could become continuous. To be honest, it's probably best described as continuous, but because it's whole numbers, you could go either way. So when we see here is we see dots that represent each kid, and there's a dot placed at each kid's spot. So if one kid said, hey, I exercise for five hours a week, well, then we put a dot right here at five hours for that particular kid. Um, if somebody else said, I exercise for seven hours, then we put a dot here. Another kid said seven hours. So again, we just stack these dots on top of each other. So if another kid came in later on and said, oh, I exercise for seven hours a week, we would just stack that next dot right on top of that one. And it allows us to see the data. And also the video games is here as well. So notice my number line went from zero to 14. Why did I, did I not go more? Well, I didn't have any values more than that, right? Um, but don't just be like, well, there's a couple kids at 12. I'm just going to stop at 10. No, you need to cover all of your data. And notice that the increments went by one. One, two, three, four. Even though I didn't put the one, I didn't put the odd numbers in there. That's okay. I still have marks in there for them. All right, and then again, you got to look at this and talk about the distribution. For example, video games. Looks like video games range from some kid that played zero video games all the way up to a kid played 14 hours a week of video games. But it looks like a lot of kids were 6 to 12 hours a week. So again, I'm talking about what values the variable could take on and what was most often. That's talking about the distribution. Dot plots are really easy. Again, you could use them for discrete or continuous, but it's really meant for whole numbers. So even if you are continuous, it's better if you have whole numbers for this. All right, stem and leaf plots. I'm sure you've seen these before. Here, we the advantage to a stem and leaf plot is you literally could see the numbers, right? Whereas a dot plot, I just put a dot there. Here, we actually use the numbers as the dots. So um, here are the final stock prices at the end of a day for 24 stocks. So we looked at 24 stocks, and at the end of the day, you know, what was the final sale price at the end of the day for those stocks? And notice that the key here is really important because... This 3, 4 could be 34, could be 34,000, could be 34 million, could be 3.4, could be 0.34. I mean, your stem and your leaves are defined by the key. So the key allows me to see, oh, okay, 80. Each would be a whole number. 8, 0 would be 80. So this would be 34, 34, 35, 52, 61, 61. Those would be the numbers that we see in the stem and leaf plot here. So that's the advantage to this is you can actually see the data, which is kind of nice. You do have to be really neat about it. Make sure that they stack up. Like, don't leave big gaps. Like, don't do a five and then a big gap and another five. Then a small gap. You know, kind of make it neat. The other key thing here is the numbers have to be in order. So notice that they go in order. One, one, two, five, 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 five. They got to go in order. So this is a stem and leaf plot. Pretty nice here. Um, and again, this allows us to see the distribution. So I could see that the smallest price was $34. The ex most expensive was $150. But it looks like most stocks ended around $60 to $70. So again, what values the variable takes on and what's kind of the most often occurring values, that's discussed in the distribution. Now, there is such a thing called a split stem and leaf plot. So imagine if I did 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6. Now, what we do here is this is if we have a lot of data. We don't have a lot of data here, which is why we didn't do it. But if you had a lot of data, you could do this. Now, the first three would be for the lower threes, 30 through 34. The second three would be for the upper threes, 35 through 39. 
So the 4 and the 4 would go here, and that 35 would go here. And then, again, nobody was in the 40s. We have the 52. Uh, nobody was in the upper 50s. And then for the 60s, the 1, 1, and 2 would go here. And then all of the 5s, there were 5 5s. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those 5s would go there. All splitting the stems up does it. It's meant for large sets of data where, you know, you don't want... 80 numbers to be reaching out. You don't want it to be such a huge thing that it kind of looks messy. So sometimes we split the cells. Not too often do we do that, but you never know. All right. The key thing is being able to really read these and understand what they tell us. All right. The, here's another example. This is what we call a back-to-back -back stem and leaf plot. This is meant for comparing two sets of data. So we looked at the number of calories in tortilla chips on the right and the number of calories in 11 bags of potato chips on the left. So it's a nice way to kind of compare. So again, the key is important. So this allows me to see that that's 150 calories. So this would be 110 calories, 120 calories over here to the left, 135 calories, and so forth. And again, this allows us to do a nice job comparing. So, for example, I could say, oh, tortilla chips range from as low as 110 to as high as 160 calories, while potato chips are a little bit higher. They go from about 120 to 172. Now, be careful here. Some kids will think this is 217. No, the, the middle is the start, no matter if you go left or right. So, it'd be 172. So, you could see the potato chips tend to have more calories. Um, most tortilla chips are around 140 to 150 calories whereas most potato chips are 150 to 160 calories. So again, I'm talking about the distribution, what values the variable takes on, and kind of what's most often. But when you have a back-to-back -back like this, you could compare them, which is kind of nice. All right, the final way that we could display quantitative data, and this works absolutely best for continuous quantitative values, is a histogram. Now, um, histograms... Um, look a lot like bar graphs, but don't you dare ever call a histogram a bar graph or a bar graph a histogram. They are very different things. Histograms have bars, but they're for quantitative data. So bar graph is the term we use for categorical variables. Histogram is the term we use for quantitative variables. So this histogram here represents the heights of 120 trees. So here's what we did, same as we've been doing. The x-axis is our number line. You don't have to start at zero, start wherever your data is. So I started at 100, and I went to 350, because I had no trees more than that. And then I decided to go by 50s. So 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 350. Again, that's up to me. You just got to stay consistent. Now, what you do on the y-axis is that you basically stack how many trees fell into that bin. So, for example, this bin right here, 100 to 150, this would be a bin for any tree that starts at 100 centimeters and go up to 150. We call this a left-handed bin, meaning that we equal the left side, we go up to the right side. So if you are a tree from 100 to 149.99999999 centimeters, you would go into this bin right here. And it looks like maybe four trees fell into that bin. That is one disadvantage. Uh, we talked about this with bar graphs as well. One disadvantage is that you kind of have to eyeball what you think that is, and it looks like about four. So that is the four. Four trees fell into that bin. Now, if I go into the next bin, this bin is for 150 up to 199.99999, and that pretty much looks like there were 30 trees in that bin. Now, one negative thing about a histogram is that it allows me to see how many trees fall into each interval or bin, but it doesn't tell me what those values are. So I know that there's 30 trees within this bin right here, but I don't know what their heights are. There could be a 150, a 151, a 152, a 160, a 163.7, a 179.42 centimeters. I have no idea what they are. Heck, to be quite honest, all 30 trees in this bin could be 175, every single one of them. I just don't know. So histograms aren't meant to give you a ton of information. they just given to allow you to see the distribution, which is what I've been kind of talking about through this whole video. So again, obviously carries on. For example, there are 50 trees from 250 up to 300, 299.9999, and so forth. So that's kind of how we view a histogram here. Now notice that there is no gap. 
absolutely no gap. Now, the only way there would be a gap is if no trees fell into that bin. But you have to have every bin labeled and you have to have data. You don't have to have data in every bin, but they need to be next to each other, right? So notice that I don't put a gap. Like I don't do 150 to 200 and then a little tiny gap. See, that's what you do with a bar graph. Bar graphs are for categorical data. So if you've got blue, red, green, then yeah, you have a gap between the blue bar and the green bar and the red bar. But when you're dealing with numbers, it's a continual interval, continuous, continual variable. And that is why there's no gaps. The only, again, the only reason why there'd be a gap is that there was no data in that bin. No trees fell into that bin. All right, so that's a histogram. Histograms are by far the most often used, especially with measurable data. If you've got measurable data, especially when it could be decimals, three decimals, four decimals, whatever, you're definitely going to go, to go with the histogram here to talk about it, okay? Now, you could also have a relative histogram. A relative histogram would just be the proportion. For example, um, instead of the y-axis being how many trees be, what proportion of trees. So I would take the four trees that were in this bin, I would divide by 120 trees, and that bin would go to the percentage or the proportion instead of the counts. So those are very common as well. Here is another example of a histogram. A uh, little bit tougher to read because of the no colors, but whatever. You don't, it doesn't have to be colored, but, you know, make sure you understand the context. We have 26 chimpanzees, and we asked each chimpanzee to complete a navigational task. And we recorded how many minutes it took them. And this would be a continuous variable, right? Because you got minutes, you got seconds, you got half seconds, nanoseconds, whatever. So um, here we decided to go from zero all the way to 100. So it did take 100 minutes for the most, right? Then we have our bins here. I decided to go by tens, but I didn't label the tens. So I have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. So here, this is actually a very nice one because I labeled how many were in each bin. You don't have to do that, but it's kind of nice when you do. So this means that six chimpanzees took anywhere from zero up to 10 minutes, 9.99999 minutes to complete the navigational task. Um, this um, chimpanzee right here, there was one chimpanzee that took somewhere between 90 and 100 minutes. Again, the drawback of a histogram, without knowing the data numbers, I don't know what this actual score was. This value could be 95, it could be 96, could be 97, could be 98.14 minutes. Again, I don't know. That's the only drawback to a histogram is that you don't know exactly what the values in those bins were. They're just meant to show the frequencies or the counts, okay? So pretty nice. We have dot plots that are kind of more for whole number data. We got stem and leaf plots, which I know you've seen before. We got um, histograms, which you probably have seen, but you might have said, oh, that looks like a bar graph. Not bar graphs. They are histograms for quantitative uh, variables, all right? So, you know, What's most important is that with any graph given to you, you got to be able to answer questions about it. All graphs convey information to you about the distribution of the data. So you have to be able to read a graph and answer questions. So if we go back to this graph right here, A, I'd expect you to be able to say, hey, the distribution shows that, you know, the chimps were anywhere from zero to 100 minutes, but it looks like most chimps were around 10 to 50 minutes for most chimps to finish it, right? That's kind of what's common. Um, lastly, be able to answer questions. Like if I said, all right, what percentage of chimps took over 40 minutes? Well, that's an easy question. Hope you know how to answer it. What percentage of chimps took over 40 minutes? So now I got to look at 40 minutes right here. Looks like four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine out of 26 chimps took over 40 minutes. So then I got to go nine divided by 26. And that would be 0.3462. I could write that as a decimal, 0.3462. Or I could write that as a percentage, 34.62%. But that's a pretty easy question. So the point is, is no times are you just going to be given a histogram and asked to stare at it. You're going to be asked to answer some questions about it or maybe even talk about it. All right, guys, that's it. A little bit of a longer topic here, but a really important one because we're going to see these graphs the rest of the year.